In the summer of 1660, news reached the colonies that Charles II had returned to England and been crowned king. Today, we're going to look at the story of how that happened and how the news was received in the colonies. You're listening to Rejects and Revolutionaries with Sarah Tinsalpula, a podcast tracing the origins of America from the Tudor era to the 20th century. By the time of the Restoration, the idea of bringing the king back had widespread support in England and most of its colonies. I mean, think of everything we've discussed over the past few months, and indeed years, and the person holding everything together, Oliver Cromwell, had died in September of 1658. There were people who were devastated by this, but not all that many. The public at large was pretty burned out on the whole Cromwell-Commonwealth thing by the time it happened. John Evelyn wrote that at Cromwell's funeral, There were none that cried but dogs, which the soldiers hooted away with a barbarous noise, drinking and taking tobacco in the streets as they went. Of course, that was an exaggeration, but it illustrates the point, and to further drive it home, the list of people who actually did mourn was full of people like John Milton, and former New Englander William Bradshaw, who walked beside Milton in the funeral procession. Hugh Peters gave the sermon at the funeral, and you get the idea. Cromwell had, for better or for worse, to his credit or his discredit, held together a country which increasingly resented his leadership. Taxes were 11 times higher than they had been under Charles I, Soldiers hadn't been paid, people who wanted a monarchy were dissatisfied, as were those who wanted a republic, and the army was full of people who didn't think that Cromwell's reforms had gone far enough. Then you have the laws which interfered with everyday life and English traditions like Morris dancing sports, maypoles, holidays like Christmas and Easter, theater, and just the relentless lack of a comfortable stability. In the best of times, rebellion and transportation lurked around the corner, and in the worst of times, they happened so violently that the outbreak of another war seemed imminent. Since the dissolution of the rump, there had been attempts to form new parliaments, but even with severely restrictive candidate and voting requirements, meant to ensure that only Cromwell supporters could get elected, Those parliaments ended up being dissolved by Cromwell after coming into conflict with him. The exception was the Second Protectorate Parliament, which increased Cromwell's power via the humble petition and advice, giving him control of an upper house of parliament and offering him the crown. He turned down the offer, but he had power far greater than any king had ever had anyway. Then, the next parliament was dismissed after conflicting with Cromwell too, and with each issue and each dispute, more and more people supported the return of the king. At this point, I don't even know that you can call support for the Restoration the Royalist cause, because it had come to include people like General Thomas Fairfax, who weren't just Willoughby-style Presbyterian parliamentarians, but active independents who had helped with the army's ascent to power, heroes of Cromwell's side. It was more the enough-is-enough cause, the please-just-make-it-stop cause, the it-can't-be-worse-than-this cause. Internationally, Commonwealth England was a success, but internally it was a country of disaffected people held together by the intelligence and forcefulness of one man who was now dead. And he'd been replaced by his 32-year-old son, Richard. And Richard was, 
Like so many leaders we've discussed, in many ways including Charles I, a nice guy with his own set of skills, but a man who was too meek and too mild to serve as an effective leader in the best of times. He had no real ambition, called his position a burden, and would have preferred to live a comfortable life away from the spotlight. It might have pleased God, he said, and the nation too, to have chosen out a person more fit and able for this work than I am. And that weakness was, as it always is, an invitation for everyone with a cause, a grudge, or just personal ambition to scramble for more power. In this case, they formed three major factions. The ones who wanted Parliament to have power, the ones who wanted the army to have power, and the ones who wanted the king to return. Civil War Part 4? Possibly. Pretty soon, Richard had a new Parliament, but one which had been elected without strict voting or candidacy requirements. The reasons for which I won't detail here, but the result of which was that this Parliament was full of all sorts of people who were furious about the way that things had been going, including plenty of royalists, as well as angry Republicans and former or disaffected parliamentarians, like Arthur Haselrig and Henry Vane, and John Fox, and Thomas Fairfax, and the Earl of Warwick's successor, as Warwick had died the year before. And the list goes on. And while Parliament pulled one direction, the army presented a petition to Richard asking to be removed from all parliamentary or governmental command and oversight. They had been meeting in secret at the house of one of their leaders named Charles Fleetwood, and now they wanted Fleetwood to be in full command of everything army-related, with no input from anyone else regarding what the army did or who led it. Richard refused this request. The problem is, as we've said before, the problem is, as we've said before, it didn't exactly matter who had legitimacy, because the army had the guns. And the army wasn't exactly shy about this. When the army had seized Charles from parliamentary custody, and Charles had asked to see the commission of the man doing so, that man had responded, This is my commission, and pointed to the soldiers behind him. During Pride's purge, when an MP asked by what power Pride was acting, he had responded, By the power of the sword. By the power of the sword. And now, Richard came face to face with the same power, and commission. Richard ordered an army muster, while Fleetwood ordered one in a completely different location, and the army totally ignored Richard and went to join Fleetwood. Then, when Richard ordered Parliament to disband, they totally ignored him too. He'd completely lost control. The press now flooded England with pamphlets advocating for the return of the Rump Parliament, and the army cut a deal with the remaining Rump members, saying that they would restore the Rump for a year in exchange for permanent indemnity for its soldiers, as well as legal and religious reforms. They would give Richard Cromwell a pension and send him on his merry way. And after a year, the rump would dissolve itself and make way for a newly elected parliament. The rump took them up on this, and Richard was in no position to disagree with anything. So he abdicated after eight months in office. So now, the third protectorate parliament was out of the way, Richard was in on issue, and the rump and the army could start bickering again. And this was the moment when the royalists decided to play their hand. 
They had planned a large-scale rebellion to take control of England's major cities, and ultimately England itself. This was a moment of vulnerability, and therefore an opportunity. But the rebellion fizzled, just like the previous ones we've discussed. The coordination wasn't there, people didn't show up, and it just didn't quite work. But it was in the aftermath of this rebellion that the rump and army fully broke their alliance. The rump asserted its authority over the army by replacing Fleetwood with Hazelrig and declaring everything that had happened under Cromwell's protectorate to be null and void. They also declared that taxes couldn't be collected without express parliamentary authority, so if the army were to take control of the government and oust parliament, they wouldn't have any legal way to collect taxes. Yes, they might be able to go around collecting money by force, but that felt dystopian even by 1659 standards. In response to the rump's actions, though, General John Lambert emerged as the head of the army faction, and he yet again expelled the rump, just like Cromwell had with his support in 1653. He put the army in complete control of England. It looked like England was gearing up for another round of civil war. But this time, the popular attitude was different. Ordinary people refused to get even slightly involved. They were so burned out on everything that had happened that they ignored it, even in London, where it was happening all around them. They went about their personal business and everyday lives like everything was normal. Two decades before, there had been angry mobs ready for a fight. One decade before, there had been shock and lamentation at how things had gone. Now, there was apathy. At this point in time, there were very few people trying to reunite the army and rump factions, because they had polarized so fast that they had virtually nothing in common except an aversion to the return of a long-exiled king. One of the people working for peace, though, was Henry Vane. In our story, Vane has rarely set aside his dedication to Republican principles for anything, so it's kind of revealing that he did now. He emerged as one of the only people, and perhaps the only person, trusted enough by both factions to try to settle an agreement. He had fought hard against both in the past, too, but he knew that resolving their conflict was the only way that the hope of an English Republic might survive another day. He even expressed the idea that a government by the army, which was not at all a democratic prospect, would have some benefits, like religious toleration, which was more than could be said of a return to monarchy. The person who had the power to decide the outcome of the conflict before it went further, though, was George Monk. Monk was the general who Cromwell had left in charge in Scotland. I'd incorrectly said that he was Scottish before, but he had been born in England, and he was a fairly interesting individual, in a very interesting position. He had been a royalist until King Charles had been defeated at Naseby, and then he'd pledged his allegiance to Parliament and fought for them with such dedication in Ireland and Scotland that he was put in charge of Scotland and its army to control on Cromwell's behalf. He had an army of 8,000 people, even after purging his ranks of anyone who supported Lambert's actions. He demanded Parliament be reinstated as England's only legal government, and when they refused, he marched that army south. Lambert rushed to meet him, 
and they stood off in northern England in November and December of 1659, but Lambert's troops refused to fight, and Fairfax showed up to support Monk, symbolically stationed at Marston Moor. And Lambert's fight was over. He surrendered and was put under house arrest. In London, Fleetwood declared that God had spit in his face and gave the keys of Parliament to its Speaker on December 24th. The rump was restored yet again, but Monk didn't turn around and go back to Scotland. Instead, without any real explanation, he continued marching toward London, and he reached the capital in early February. There, he was greeted by a couple of things. First, the press was calling for free and open elections. And second, in response to those calls, the rump was asking him to restore public order by arresting its leading opponents and dismantling the city's defenses, including removing all its gates, portcullises, posts, and chains. Monk obeyed the rump's request. But then, he turned around and ordered the rump to dissolve itself and call for new, free elections. So he had done what both sides asked him to do, and this left everyone extremely confused. But the people were overjoyed. The army was overthrown, and the rump was effectively gone. They filled the city with bonfires, and on those bonfires they roasted rumps of beef in a show of contempt for the old parliament, and they carried rumps through the city on sticks in a similar display. The rump, though, tried one last way to salvage its cause, by trying to control the outcome of the next election. And rather than fight that fight, figuring out what was legal, what wasn't, and delaying the election of a new parliament until all of that was done, Monk did something completely unexpected. He simply reversed Pride's purge, and the MPs who had been expelled by armed soldiers in 1649 were now escorted back into Parliament by armed soldiers in 1660. Most of them were dead at this point, but there were enough survivors to easily outnumber what was left of the rump. The newly restored Long Parliament nullified everything that had happened since Pride's Purge, sent the leaders of Cromwell's regime to the Tower, and then voted to dissolve itself. Quick, easy, elegant. Almost poetic. And with their self-disillusion, Monk was, by default, back in control of what would happen next. But people still had no idea of what he was actually up to. Even in April, Almost two months after his arrival, reports were that Monk was either in London to bring the king back or to prevent his return. Monk was secretly meeting with royalist Sir John Greville, though, and through Greville, he was corresponding with Charles II. The meetings were so secret that Monk didn't even want anything written down during them, so we can't tell exactly what happened. But regardless, the result of those meetings was that Charles II issued the Declaration of Breda. And in that declaration, he made himself seem like the answer to everyone's problems. Those who had supported Parliament could expect a free pardon and amnesty unless they had voted for the execution of his father. They could also expect religious toleration for all peaceful Protestants, and Charles would give Parliament the power and authority to implement all of this. This, of course, did also mean that Parliament would take the blame for any unpopular policies or failures, because politics. People were ecstatic, and a new heavily royalist parliament was quickly elected. It sat on May 1st, the declaration was read aloud, and enthusiastically accepted. 
A delegation went to meet Charles with money to help him move his court back to England, and one of the members of that delegation was Nicholas Crisp, the former Guinea Company leader. And it was William Penn's ship that brought the new king back to England, a service for which he was knighted. It was declared that according to the ancient and fundamental laws of this kingdom, the government is and ought to be by king, lords, and commons. And by May 29th, the king was back in London. The entire month was full of celebrations. May Day saw the country covered in maypoles, and the few authorities who tried to saw them down were attacked and driven away. People drank the king's health in the streets on their knees, and Charles's trip from Dover to London was surrounded by ecstatic crowds, bells, trumpets, folk music, morris dancers. The streets were covered in flowers, houses hung with tapestries, and the unrestrained enthusiasm prompted the new king to joke that he should have come back sooner. As the new king entered Whitehall Palace, he saw the sight of his father's execution and nearly cried. Then he walked around the childhood home that he'd been forced to flee when he was 13 years old and he hardly stepped foot outside the palace for a year. He was 30 years old, and by contemporary descriptions, tall, gaunt, and gray, with a somber look, even though he smiled. And he carefully took control. He became known as a secretive king who met with a group of six trusted advisors before he would meet with his full privy council. He passed the Act of Indemnity and Oblivion, which granted a pardon to all former parliamentarians except the regicides and a handful of others. And that act marks the end for some of the characters in our story. Hugh Peters hadn't technically voted for the regicide, but he had been so vocally in support of it that people have speculated both that it was originally his idea and that he was the executioner whose identity has never been revealed. He was hanged, drawn, and quartered, along with nine others. Some of the regicides were already dead, like Cromwell and Bradshaw, and they were posthumously executed, their bodies dug up, and what was left of them hanged, drawn, and quartered. Yet others were imprisoned without being executed, and others escaped. Of the ones that escaped, two went to New England, but we'll have to talk about them another day. Archibald Campbell, the Marquess of Argyll, was also exempted from the act in Scotland when letters showed a close enough collaboration between him and Cromwell to indicate that he likely approved of the regicide. And in addition to the regicides, John Lambert and Henry Vane were exempted from indemnity. Lambert was imprisoned for the rest of his life, but Vane was executed. He made it clear that he would not accept a return to monarchy. He wasn't a regicide because he wouldn't support the government after Pride's Purge, but he also wouldn't support a newly restored monarchy. Instead of defending himself against the dubious charge of treason, He used his trial to defend his Republican principles. Both my estate and my life are in such eminent peril. Nay, more than my life, the concerns of thousands of lives are in it. Not only those who are in their graves already, but of all posterity in time to come. Had nothing been in it but the care to preserve my own life, I needed not have stayed in England, but might have taken my opportunity to withdraw myself into foreign parts to provide for my own safety, he said. I have also taken notice, in the little reading that I have done of history, how glorious the very heathen have rendered their names to posterity in the contempt that they have shown of death when the laying down of their lives has appeared to be their duty from the love which they have owed their country. Charles declared Vane 
too dangerous a man to let live, and he was beheaded, though not hanged, drawn, and quartered in the traditional traitor's death. It's kind of an interesting parallel, though, between Henry Vane and Hugh Peters. They had been friends turned bitter enemies in 1630s Massachusetts, and both had returned to England, where they had continued to oppose each other's position, even within the context of the parliamentary independent movement. And now, both were executed in the aftermath of the Restoration. It was the end of an era. When news of the Restoration reached America, though, the enthusiasm was even greater than it had been in England. Barbados, Jamaica, Bermuda, Suriname, and even Plymouth and Rhode Island rushed to proclaim the new king. They lowered the Commonwealth standard and replaced it with the royal one. Plymouth, more moderate than most New England colonies, had been uncomfortable with the course that the Commonwealth had taken and was relieved though perhaps with somewhat mixed feelings, to see a sense of normalcy return. The restoration was particularly good news for Rhode Island, because the Declaration of Breda confirmed not only religious toleration, but also the rights the Williams faction had been seeking within the colony. And when Charles returned to the throne, he sent John Clark back to Rhode Island with a new commission, solidifying the colony's future. The rest of New England, though, dragged their feet in recognizing the new king in a way that we'll have to discuss in a different episode. But what I'll say here is that they refused to believe rumors of the restoration until they were doubly and triply confirmed. And when that happened, Davenport wrote the following to Winthrop Jr. Our comfort is that the Lord reigneth, and his counsels shall stand. In rightly obeying his king, we shall become faithful to whatever powers he settles over us. In Barbados, Governor Modiford greeted the assembly with the news. You have been summoned in his majesty's name. The sweet sound whereof hath not for almost these ten years been heard on this island. Ex-Governor Searle considered moving to New England to be among independent Puritans during whatever was to come, but the island was overwhelmingly happy. In Bermuda, the news came with instructions from the company not to use the occasion as an excuse for debaucheries and other enormities and we don't have any record of the extent to which those instructions weren't heeded, so we can only imagine. They did adopt the Church of England immediately, though. Maryland was more cautious than most other colonies after everything that had happened there, and its leadership delayed its announcement by a month, finally saying that the king didn't need them to make him king, but they were happy to show their obedience. And it was in Virginia where celebrations were predictably most intense of all. In fact, if I had a time machine, this is one of the events that I would like to visit because I just want to see this in person. By the time that news of the restoration reached Virginia, Berkeley had had time to arrive with a royal commission proclaiming him governor, and that meant that he was the man who proclaimed the new king. And then the colony went wild. Whatever alcohol there was, people used it to drink health to the king. Whatever could be used to fill the air with noise, they did it. This wasn't the flowers and Morris dancers of English celebrations. Trumpets sounded, yes, but guns were shot off, repeatedly, and there was laughter, singing, dancing, hugging, kissing, tossing of hats, in the fields, on the roads, shouts of, The King! The King! To people who had been injured in the wars, or who had otherwise distinguished themselves in the service of the King, 
the assembly voted to give gifts. Tens of thousands of pounds of tobacco went to the people who had risked and lost everything for the cause that the colony held so dear. They then paid their preacher 500 pounds of tobacco for his Thanksgiving service, and the colony continued its spending to reward its heroes, including extravagant pay for the Burgesses over the next few years. The celebration continued constantly for days, but of course, there were a handful of people who weren't participating. Puritans like William Claiborne. And in York County, the triumphant royalists paid a handful of men a few hundred pounds of tobacco to bring these Puritans into town. So they went in their canoes, fetched Claiborne and his associates, and as they stood in front of the cavaliers who were now in charge, they were apprised of the situation in the county. These people had governed Virginia on behalf of the hated Cromwell, and one of them even had two cannons. The fact that they weren't celebrating the king's return meant that they had the only remaining booze and gunpowder around, and those cannons sound really cool, and so the county would like to pay them a fair market price, or whatever, it's a celebration, double the fair market price, for all of those things in order to keep the party going. Claiborne and the others agreed, so a few thousand pounds of tobacco later, the county had a barrel of gunpowder, another of liquor, a bunch of cider barrels, two cannons, and a solid few more days of partying. Long live Charles II, King of England, Scotland, France, Ireland, and Virginia. Virginia.